Welcome to this McGraw-Hill Education webinar, Personalizing Instruction, Five Differentiated Activities to Use in Your Classroom Now. I'm Kelsey Jenkins with McGraw-Hill Education and I will be the webinar moderator for today's session. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few quick housekeeping items. This webinar is being presented in listen-only mode, which means you will be able to hear the presenter, but he will not be able to hear you. However, that doesn't mean we don't want that you cannot participate. We, of course, want to hear your questions you have, so just type them into the question panel on your toolbar. We'll address questions um, and do a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Joining us today is Jeff Omer. Jeff is the Senior National Literacy Curriculum Specialist with McGraw-Hill Education. In his role, he works at the school and district level to support the implementation of research-validated instructional practices to improve student achievement. Over the years, he has presented at many state and regional conferences around the country, focusing on literacy, mathematics, and the integration of technology into the classroom. So welcome, Jeff, and we're excited for your presentation. Hi, everybody. Welcome, and thanks so much for joining us today. We have another um, great group of people here today. Um, a lot of people joined us from all over the country. We're so excited you're here. Um, and as Kelsey mentioned, please, Feel free to ask questions as we go through the presentation today. As we're talking, if something comes up that you really want to ask that question, go ahead and type in the question area. But I also encourage you to engage in the chat section as well. As something comes up, if you have an idea you want to share, please put it there so everyone can see it. That's the best way for us to learn from each other, is to actually put something in the chat area. So I did already ask you where you're joining us from today, and, I'm, and, and again, I know some of you don't like to do that, which is fine, but if you do, please feel free to type in where you're joining us from, because it's good to see that people from, from Georgia, from Pennsylvania, from Maryland, Missouri, all over the country um, here today, Oklahoma. So thank you so much for being here today. And this session is focused on um, that personalizing instruction. What, what differentiation activities can you use in your classroom? And differentiation instruction is not a new topic. It's something we've been talking about for years and years and years. And that's why I'm excited to do this session today to learn from each other as I can share some ideas with you as well. So again, please share those topics and those ideas as we're moving. So the topic is, and the, one of our goals is to give you five activities you can use in your classroom to meet the needs of diverse learners. And I actually lied. I'm going to give you a lot more than five. Um, I'm going to give you five different areas. You're going to get like 15 or 20, and you take a few that are going to work best for you in your classroom. Not every one is going to be perfect for you, but that's okay. Find a few that you like and really grab onto them. Um, we're going to talk about workshop. If you teach open court, you might call it workshop. If you teach another program, you might call it center time or whatever. We're going to talk about how to implement this small group instruction time. And then I'm going to show you a couple things online available as well with open court reading just to show you what's there as well. But again, this content is for any program, any resource you're using in your classroom. The ideas can be beneficial for any student no matter what you're using. So the first thing we're going to do today is we're going to focus on really what is differentiated instruction. When we talk about it, what is our focus going to be? And as I move along, this is going to be my, my definition I'm working with as we, as we go through so you can kind of see what angle I'm taking. Um, so differentiation, this is, uh, I got this from Catlin Tucker's website, but she, I think she actually got it from Sue Watson. So again, the idea of differentiated instruction is the idea of modifying and adapting instruction materials, content, projects, products, and assessment to meet the needs of the different needs of learning to use in your classroom. So again, the main focus is the instruction, the materials, the content. The, what are we doing in our classroom and how can we differentiate it? Because our goal is to be sure we're meeting the needs of every learner. But the big idea is, okay, how can we make sure we're engaging everybody? What can we do to modify that activity, that instruction, the materials, the content to meet the needs of all our learners? And that's really the focus uh, on how we're, as we're going, how we're going to be talking about it today. Now, as we have this discussion, I always focus on the fact that this is, we talk about differentiation, it's for all students. Uh, many times when we talk about differentiated instruction, we talk about, and a lot of people are saying, what about our kids that are really, really struggling? Which, of course, that's, that's, a, that's a group we want to differentiate for. But I also want to make sure we focus on the whole group. What about our challenge students? How can we accelerate them a little bit farther? What can we do with our intervention students, our tier twos, our tier threes, our English learners, or a middle of the road average student that does pretty well, but I know I can get them to do a little bit better if I can just tweak it a little bit more. 
And that's what we're going to be focusing on is what can we do? And as I give you these activities and ideas, we're going to talk about how these are for every single student in your classroom. Or, how, you know, or this is maybe an activity for your challenge student, but how can we also make that adjustment for a differentiated student, for our English learner, for our middle of the road? What can we do to help them out? That's really what our focus is going to be on today as we're talking. So the question is, is so, so why, is this, why is this so important? Why are we so worried about differentiated instruction? Why, and again, I'm asking this more as rhetorical because you guys already know this answer. The, the data tells us that right now our classrooms are more diverse than ever. It is something that we've noticed over the years. I've noticed over the years visiting schools across the country. And I've, we've seen that our classrooms are so much more diverse than they were even five years ago or 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Much more diverse classrooms. Our English learner um, numbers are, are exploding. And the idea that um, our advanced students are more advanced and our struggling students in many cases are struggling more than ever. So we have a challenge up, on, upon us. We all have it because that group is, is more diverse. They're, we're doing more inclusion classrooms. We have more students that are accelerating. And so our challenge is what do we do? So in that quick five minutes, I just wanted to kind of set the framework for here's where we're going. This is what we talked about as our, as our whole goal. These are the students we're talking This is why we're talking about. Now let's dig in a little bit and say, okay, what can we do to help these students? What are some specific things we can do to help our students? So we're going to focus on what are activities we can do. And again, I'm going to focus on the big idea, um, five areas with activities. So we're going to have a lot more than five to share. Pick a few that you really like and run with it. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about, though, is, is when you think about your classroom, there are times, and some of us more than others, your whole group lesson. There are easy things you can do in your classroom every day to differentiate. And again, this is where I want you to start chatting too. Some ideas you use. If you're teaching a whole group lesson, what are some little things you can do in that whole group lesson to differentiate that instruction? What can you do to help that student on the fringe become more engaged and help them get what you're teaching? And the one thing I always tell folks is don't forget about the pre-teach. So I said before, it's during the lesson, but it's actually what you do maybe 10 minutes before that lesson. Pre-teach a concept, pre-teach that sound, pre-teach those high frequency words, pre-teach a couple things to those students on the edge, those students that may be struggling, because that those couple minutes that you give those students is invaluable because you just gave them that clue that they needed. Something else you can do easily, the turn and talk, tell your neighbor. Easy way to differentiate that instruction. Um, something that I've used when I visit classrooms to do demo lessons all the time. It's a slight differentiation because if I'm not getting, I'm going to hear from my neighbor. So the turn and talk, tell your neighbor is an excellent way to help you differentiate. Some activities may it may need additional scaffolding. If you're teaching open court, maybe you do more sound by sound blending than a whole word blending, or you do sound by you know sounds and sequence dictation versus whole word um, dictation. All things you can do, but sometimes you're going to need to provide more supports. Easy for you to do a couple extra sentences in that whole group lesson may help those students. Um, the seating arrangement, of course, is always critical. Where you put them is most important. Those struggling students should be right up front and center. That quick little differentiation, instead of letting Jeff sit on the corner, I want Jeff right in front of me because he needs the mo he needs I need to be close to him. So that's something else you definitely want to think about. And also, of course, give yourself that extra wait time. That extra second or two of wait time is valuable, very valuable time. So again, what ideas do you have? Please. Keep typing them in. I don't see any yet, but I know you're going to type them in the chat window for me so I can have an interactive webinar. So you think about this whole group time. Yes, there's some things you need to do during that whole group session to make sure we engage our students. But now let's start focusing on different parts of your lessons. And no matter what resource you use in your classroom, chances are you have activities where you teach your students decoding. And you have your students doing blending activities or fluency practice. And you also have decodable books. So we're going to start by talking about those two areas. What can you do, no matter what you're using, if you're, you get open core of magic, you have blending lines, any other program, you still have word lines you're reading. But what can you do to differentiate instruction on these two areas? Think about decoding and fluency. And when I look at it, I think, OK, let's think about those blending lines. Let's think about those blending lessons. Let's think about what we're doing to teach our students decoding. Um, uh, one wonderful activity you can do to help your students with, with working that is having them read those words and sentences and having them create extended sentences orally. Easy thing to do. So if I had the word daydream, I want a sentence 
that uses daydream in it. I want them to, to really use, so I know that they can't just read the word, but they know what it means, so I'm kind of extending it. But orally creating extending sentences, some teachers like to put the W questions on the board, the who, what, when, where, why, and of course the how. But that's a great thing to do. If this daydream is a sentence, you know, I like to daydream. Great sentence, how can you extend it orally? I like to daydream on Tuesdays. Awesome, extend it more. I like to daydream on Tuesdays when I'm sitting in math class. Great. Now I have a longer sentence, so I'm building language, but I'm also building fluency. I'm also building um, a language fluency. I'm also making sure they know what the word daydream means. So an easy thing to do, orally create those extended sentences. Um, when you're done with an activity, a great thing to do, when I used to, in my classroom, we used to cut them up. You know, or if you already do them, like on, if you use letter cards or word cards, have, you know, having the word sorts. Find a spelling pattern, sort all the A blank E words over here, all the O blank E words over here, all the short vowel here, all the compound words, all the closed syllables, all the open syllables, whatever skill you're teaching, doing a word sort is so valuable for our students because it helps them dig a little bit deeper, helps them dive further into those lines, and it really gives them some great activities that you can easily do, again, in your classroom that your students can do easily. And once you teach them that routine, that's something they can always do because there's a value to that because they're going to get more knowledge out of doing that. Again, if we're doing those oral sentences, you can also always give them a chance to do writing extended sentences. Give them opportunity to do some writing. Let them write a little bit. Let them write the sentence. What comes next? What, you know, again, this would be for maybe your challenge students, but let them do a little bit more. And beyond the writing the sentences, maybe you can even have them do stories. All great things you can do very easily just with those word lines. Easy thing to do with just dealing with those word lines. And of course, decodable books are another feature. No matter what resource you have in your classroom, whether it's a decodable book or a leveled book or anything in between, the idea is you can use these books as a tool for you. Because those books, again, if you're using open court, you have practice decodables. So you have core and practice, um, one, an awesome tool. Have them practice with a partner. Have them buddy read. Have them you read in their reading telephone, their little um, their reading telephone you can make with like 50 cents using the parts from Home Depot. Um, easy thing to do with those practice decodables. Um, partner reading is easy to do. Again, I'm trying to, I want to give you things that are easy to implement. I'm not trying to make you, give you ideas that recreate the world and do a thousand different things. I want you to say, what can I do tomorrow that's easy? And practice decodables are easy. They're all digital. You can get, or you can print them out if you want to. Partner reading is easy to do. One thing teachers like to do is have students sit um, facing each other so that their ears are close to each other. It's an easy strategy, but that way your partner reading is going to turn into loud reading. So if I'm sitting and I turn myself sideways like this and I'm reading, my other partner's sitting like this sideways reading, their ears are going to be right next to each other. It's an easy way to have them partner read, and it keeps your classroom to a low roar, which is a great thing. Um, also, high-frequency words. One of the things I used to do in my classroom is you're working on your high-frequency words. One of the things with the Codal Books is there are certain high-frequency words that are a focus. Again, no matter what program you're using, have them underline those words if it's a tear-out book or a take-home book. Underline, circle those words. Um, especially for your struggling reader, I want them to know that I know the, is, on, and and, and they can see all the times that repeats it. That lets them know all these words they already know before they even get into the book. These are more wor words I know automatically. It shows them how, ex how possible it is that they're going to be able to read that very easily. So that's another great tool, a great thing to do. The same thing with your sounds and spellings. If you're in first grade or, or kindergarten, you're doing just you know CVC words, underline all the short A words, underline all the short O words, underline all the words that start with tss. easy things to do. But also the spellings, if you get to first, second, or third grade, or even upper grades, have them focus on certain sound spellings. How is this sound? We're focusing on the long A spelled A-Y. Find all the A-Y words, find all the long A words, whatever it is the focus, but the more we can dig our students into those books, the better it's going to be because that gives them um, more knowledge and more practice using those words in a fun way, but you're differentiating for them. You're making it a little bit easier, you're making it a little bit um, more challenging, but that gives them something else they can do. And also, of course, um, what comes next? What comes before it? These are all um, before and after. These are, again, I'm about easy. Those are easy things you can do. Your student that's the advanced learner that 
already knows this book when he walked in the door, awesome, read the book, and I want you to do me a favor because I want you to use the same vowel patterns. I want you to use still long A. I still want you to use these words, but I want you to extend it. What, could, what would be the next page, the next chapter, the next three pages, the next, you mean, let them extend it because that's not only building their knowledge of those letters and sounds and spellings, but it's also building their writing skills. So you guys tell me, what else would you do with decodable books? What else do you do with blending lines for differentiation, for extra practice in small groups? What do you do? Um, please get some ideas, type them out. Because again, if you share a lot of ideas, then we can share them back with you. But that is um, part of the thing to think about is, what can I do in my classroom very easily to make differentiation easy? Because I'm not about reinventing the wheel. You have a lot of tools in front of you, use those tools. So when it comes to decoding blending lines, when it comes to decoding with decodable books, both of those places are awesome places you can go very quickly, very easily to differentiate an instruction with your students. So um, just starting with that point. And again, if you're an open court person, this is green band stuff. All the things you do in green band. How do you teach that phonic skills? Those are awesome things you can do to differentiate instruction. Um, and keep your students moving along and keep them progressing because it's not just about making sure your challenge student gets an extra challenge and your intervention group gets intervention what do you do for the student in the middle how do we help him or her get better how do we help that English learner get better these activities will help a lot of your students especially that the sounds and spellings and, and and activities like that those are great things to do even sounds and spellings you can do extensions on that you we have six words that have long a spelled a y give me five war, more so they can see that pattern, they, they develop that mastery over time, which is what we really want. So that's where we're talking about green band, decodables, those are some things we think about. Now let's shift focus to the, the comprehension piece. What can we do, what can you use in your classroom right now at your fingertips to help you with differentiating instruction and comprehension and differentiating instruction and vocabulary? Two key areas that we know we need to make sure we differentiate and we need to do it well. So we're going, to, we're going to start with comprehension. What can we do in the comprehension world? What can I do to help my students um, refine, reinforce? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Deb. I got some, got some good, um, good from Deb. Take detailed anecdotal records. As you're working with small groups, you know what they need to practice. Sound flashcards, manipulate the cards, give them the ones they practice on. Excellent job or blending have the few sounds they're struggling with and give them words that have the sounds they need to practice thanks deb great idea for the decoding practice excellent practice noting where their challenges is, is a great way to do it is an awesome thing to do to keep to keep them engaged but also to help you differentiate with each other so that's a perfect idea um, and when we're looking at comprehension some things we want to focus on is really think about those strategies and skills if you're teaching predicting as your strategy. Really make sure your students understand those strategies. Early in the year, you're modeling a lot of these strategies and skills. If I'm predicting that strategy, I want to make sure my students not only know what predicting is, but I want to make sure they really know why I do it and how to do it. And the best way to do that is to model it when you're doing those, reading those one books, your selection maybe, but also be sure you're modeling when you're doing your read aloud. Make sure you give your students maybe a leveled book you're working with or a leveled passage you're reading or an open court decodable book even. And making sure that when you're doing that, you're focusing on those strategies and skills because you can teach a lot of those strategies and skills. We want to teach them how to use those strategies with complex text, but sometimes we need to give them a text that's a little bit easier to work with so I can really show them and make sure they understand how to do that. Again, my extended student, I want them to be able to do that independently. I want them to model for it to me when they're reading or when I'm reading aloud to them, I want them to take ownership of those strategies and skills. So that's one thing you can absolutely do. Another thing, using a range of texts. Um, if, you, if you have access to something, like if you have like a leveled book, that's one thing. If you have an easier decodable book, some teachers use a decodable book from a grade before. Um, just photocopy it. That's one thing to do. Um, or an anthology or, or a big book. Or if you have like a reading lab, you can use a reading lab selection. All those things will work to help you give that extra practice on the comprehension um, and using the it, different texts to work on those strategies and skills. Um, making sure they understand the story. Illustrating kindergarten. We do this a lot in kindergarten um, with some drawing activities and writing activities. But having them illustrate the story. Because if they really understand what's going on in the story, a quick illustration is easy for them to do. 
um, making sure, you know, what happened in this page? We read it, but what, what, what's it look like to you? Illustrating, especially your, maybe your language learners or your students that may be struggling, that's a great way that you can check and make sure they're getting it, that it's making sense to them, but it also gives them confidence that what they're doing, that they're learning something and they're doing well with it. Um, rewriting the end of the story is another great thing to do. This is a challenge one possibly. Um, you're rewriting the story, adding new characters. Add, add yourself into it. What happened next? You walk down the street, what happens next? A great way to work on comprehension because you know where the story ended, that helps them take it to the next level. Really easy to do. Um, and of course, extending and thinking too about um, an inquiry. I mean, if you are really reading and comprehending and building knowledge with your themes that you're teaching, again, no matter what you're teaching, no matter what you're using, think about inquiry as an angle. Um, we're going to talk more about inquiry, I think, next month or the month after focusing just on inquiry because inquiry is that piece that we really want to engage our students in. We really want to get our students thinking bigger and further down. I want them to read, but I also want them to understand and ask questions. When you ask questions, that's where learning really takes place. When you ask questions, then you find answers, and then you have to do reading and, and comprehending and research and presenting. That is pure power. And if you're looking to truly differentiate your comprehension strand and your knowledge as they're building knowledge, think about the inquiry strand as one place to go that can really take you to that next level. So all, again, easy things you can do. Use what you have in your classroom. Use some ideas that you already got in place. And maybe grab one of these and try it out and see how it works tomorrow. I mean, that's the whole goal of this. Um, now you think about uh, vocabulary. Um, vocabulary is a big deal. We know of our English learners they have a huge gap. We know with our struggling learners, they have a huge gap. But we also know with our advanced learners, we need to extend them. We need to push them beyond where we're at right now. We need to give them more practice. So how do we do that? What are some things you can do easily in your classroom? And one may be to limit the number of words. Instead of seven, use five. Um, I still want them to find a way to get to that seven, but maybe I need to be focused on the number of words. That's an easy, especially with your struggling students. Um, think about the strategies. Um, a lot of folks, as at Open Court, you focus on it, but think about strategies, word structure, context clues, apposition, those three strategies. Word structure is huge because you look at that whole word and you see the prefix, the root, the suffix. You can figure out the meaning of the word just by knowing those pieces of the word. Apposition, that's when the sentence is right there. The definition is there. Right after it, you have the sentence. It has the, def the word and then the definition, an easy thing to grab onto. And context clues is, is the most common. But teaching those strategies is important and modeling those strategies when you're reading aloud, modeling those strategies when you're working with your students, that's an incredible thing to do as well. Um, of course, illustrating the words. I love using, you could use like a folding a folding activity, your, your foldable where you fold something out and have the, have the squares and have them write the word and illustrate what it means to them. Also using like a kid-friendly definition, the same thing goes right with that. But activities like that helps solidify the meaning of those vocabulary words. And these activities, illustrating the words, this could also go back to what I just talked about before when you're talking about blending lines. If there's some words your kids need to know, have them draw it to make sure you're doing language with that. So that's a connection I just thought of now as I was talking to you. Um, of course, photographs. If you have photo library cards, that's one thing. If not, you, there's a m millions of photographs online you can use. You'll find the photos, download the photos, save the photos. You have a wonderful, you have a wealth of information out there to really help you with building that vocabulary. So think about that as well. Acting the words out, Deb, absolutely. Deb had a great idea with acting the words out. Um, fantastic, the movement is better. And that was the next one I was putting up too. We're thinking the same way. The more action, the better. We have so many different learners. If you have a student that learns better by moving, Getting them to act them out is a fantastic way to do that. So definitely think about that too. And of course, writing stories of vocabulary. The old school does, there's nothing wrong with the old school activity that we've always done is writing stories of vocabulary. Um, but think about this. Um, we know that if we don't get our kids vocabulary, if we don't build that vocabulary knowledge, if we don't get them more and more comfortable with their vocabulary, and more confident with their vocabulary, then they're not going to be as successful. So we need to make sure we take the extra time and we do those extra activities to really hone in on the vocabulary instruction, really hone in on the words, what they mean, and again, applying those things as well. 
if you're looking at any of these activities, think about how you can do it in your classroom tomorrow. Think about how easy you can have them illustrate a word. Maybe you do this already. Is there a twist you might put onto that? Um, finding using photographs is a great way for that language development. All these things, again, the goal is to find one or two that you can just grab onto, you really like, and then run with them. So that's another way to go with vocabulary. Um, Another great idea Deb just put up there, word wall with interesting words in the books they read. They choose the words. That's a great thing to do because sometimes you read books that your kids just, there's words in it they just love and they think they're fascinating. I love doing it with kids that, and that's a fantastic idea. They choose the words, they put them on the wall. That's fantastic because if, we, if they own it, they're gonna use it so much more. Then they're gonna start using those words because that's a word that they like that they chose. So excellent, excellent idea, Deb. Um, fantastic. So vocabulary, make sure you take that time to differentiate when you need to with the comprehension of vocabulary. Even um, backing up the comprehension for a second before I wrap this section up, think about the support, and, and Shanahan had something out this week about supporting students with comprehension. And, and helping them as they're reading selections, helping them when, you know, because they have to read it first to comprehend it, but giving them the support to read it. Whether you read to them, they read to you, we read as a group, you let the computer read, you let the CD read, whatever it is. But the main focus is on any of these activities, they've got to have their nose in the book. I'm not sitting there listening in, you know, passively. If I'm having a story read to me, if I'm working on comprehension to help my kids with comprehension, I want their nose in the book, I want them tracking because they need to see and they need to hear what's going on in that selection. So all great things. Um, another one, Ruth just put up their top 10 favorite words. We choose the words that we love to say or use. That's awesome. Another great activity. Um, let them put, what are your favorite words? Because it's fun, again, if you teach K1, 2, there's nothing better than giving your kids a multisyllabic word that they just will grab onto and they, they'll love it and they'll use it all the time and that's, Again, you're building your knowledge and confidence in those students. So, excellent. Thank you guys for the, the ideas. Keep them flowing, please. Um, the last thing I want to talk about quickly is writing. What can we do to differentiate for any? Because writing is, when I work with teachers and with schools and administrators, writing is the area that people, that teachers always, they say it's hard for my kids. My kids struggle with writing. They, they have a hard time making it work. They have a hard time pulling it together. So writing is definitely somewhere we need to differentiate when, ne when necessary. Um, one way to differentiate, again, this isn't quite differentiate, what it is, is max using graphic organizers more and more effectively. Um, a lot of folks like to use graphic organizers, but remember, you have a group of students that may be struggling. So you can throw up a tree diagram, or you can throw up a web, or throw up any, but if they don't know how to use it, it doesn't do them any good. So maximize those graphic organizers. Maybe have them teach each other how to use a graphic organizer if you're, they're not sure. But don't assume they know how to use them, especially now in September. They may or may not know how to use those graphic organizers. Take an idea and make sure they know how to use those. Sentence stems are great, especially for your English learners. Give them those sentence stems to fill in. Scaffold away though. We start with that extra support, but by the mid-year, we want to back off because the more independent they can be, the better that's gonna be for your students. Um, thinking about um, sentence strips, sentence strips are a great, great support piece. Always use sentence strips in my classroom, but sometimes that helps them see things, and then, especially when you go to revising, it helps reorganizing things as well. So definitely think about sentence strips, and also model. Model, model, model. Um, to support your writing, you may have some students writing independently, but a lot of teachers find that it's really helpful to really do, and it's not just model, I'm gonna show, I'm gonna model my students through the whole process of writing. If I'm writing, write, responding to text, I wanna show them and model explicitly how to do that. Because some of our students aren't gonna get it if we don't explicitly show them how do I do this? How do I pull this all together? So that's just some things there for writing. And I'm sure you guys have some more ideas as well. I see Julia had a great ad for comprehension. Students can apply the strategies being taught in independent reading books. This is natural differentiation activity. They need to apply the skills and strategies to the text they can read at their independent reading level. 100% agree, Julia. We want them to get that practice. If we can get them, they apply those strategies. That's why if you're teaching comprehension strategies, the predicting, the summarizing, the making connections, 
all those wonderful activities, if you can take and make sure that when you teach those strategies, you have those strategies listed on the wall so they can see those strategies all day long and use those strategies all day long as well. Thank you, Julia. Fantastic idea. So those are, again, I said five, but again, there's about 20 or 25 here that I gave you. But I want you to think back what we talked about with the blending lines, with the decodable text, with the comprehension, with the vocabulary, and even with the writing. And think about what is what are one or two things that I shared with you today or that I read to you that you see in front of you that you might want to try in your classroom tomorrow. What is Give yourself a challenge. I'm going to try this tomorrow. I'm going to try, you know, don't give yourself till next Monday. Try, what are you going to try tomorrow? Because if you think of something to try tomorrow, then that gives you an actionable item right now. And it helps you move yourself along the line. But what happens a lot of times is when I talk with schools and I talk with teachers, a lot of folks say, okay, I love the idea. I want to do differentiation. I want to do these small groups. But the challenge a lot of folks have sometimes is how do I get it done? Now, I'm going to say implementing workshop, but it could be implementing any small group time in your classroom because the way it is implemented will make it either the most successful thing in the world or something you'll never do again. And I've observed both happen um, just because of the way it's implemented. So let's talk about this. How do we make sure we implement workshop or small group instruction um, time efficiently and effectively in our classroom? How do we get this going? Um, and the first thing I always talk about is organize, make sure you have an organization to your room. Think about your room and think about how you how you're gonna if your room is small and you need to put things in little cubbies or little um, carriers then think about what you're gonna put in your carriers you're gonna have a writing area what are you gonna put in your writing carrier maybe paper and pencils and markers and crayons and color pencils or you know staple or whatever that goes in a little plastic carrier or what if you have um, and then another carrier might be your fluency that you have a, a bunch of decodable books in it or your listening area. You know, what I, I've seen everything to be portable, and I've seen classrooms really big where you have an area where they can listen to the computer, an area where they can listen to books on tape, an area where they can do their writing. The suggestion with organizing your classroom, though, is think about the noisy stuff and the not noisy stuff. That there's going to be some things that are good. There's going to be noise in your classroom when you're doing um, workshop or small group instruction time. That's okay. That is a great thing to do. The more times we have our students talking, the better. We need to have that time. But there are some things like quiet reading that's not going to involve a lot of noise. Or writing may not involve a lot. Maybe those things stay on one side and your games and your computers on the other side so the noise is stays one area. Um, establishing the rules. One of the things that I suggest is, and we always do this in training. Some of you have been through a training before, you've seen it, or you think about, oh, yeah, I do that, of course. But your workshop small group rules may be different than the rest of your rules um, because it isn't going to be quiet. Some teachers I know they have a level two, level three, level four noise. What are your rules for workshop small group time? Yes, you're going to talk. How many people can you, what's your noise level going to be? Think about the rules that make sense to you. Keep them realistic. It's not going to be quiet. If it's quiet, then it's not workshop small group time. It's, you know, paper time. So think about your rules. Um, the other thing I suggest too is that especially when you start implementing small group time, the one thing I always recommend is build it into your schedule. And when I say that, I don't mean do it right before lunch. Because if you put it in your schedule right before lunch, it's never going to happen. It'll never happen. I guarantee you, you'll never do it. Because it'll be, oh, it's, we only have 10 minutes. We, let's just not do it today because lunchtime is coming. When I taught um, in my classroom, we did small group time in the middle of my morning. I did a little whole group time, then we did small group, then I did whole group, then I did small group. We broke it up because that, number one, makes sure you do it. But number two, um, just as importantly, it gives you time midstream to give yourself kind of a, a break from the direct teaching if that's what you're doing. But it also gives you a chance to differentiate right there when you need it. So think about that. Um, start small and grow. I always suggest this. I want 30 minutes of small group time, but it's not going to be small group 30 minutes on September 21st. It's If I haven't done it yet in my classroom, it may be 10 minutes, and then it may go to 12 minutes, then go to 15 minutes, then to 18 minutes. You know, give yourself time to grow. Whatever your schedule is, whatever your schedule looks like, make sure you build it in and say, okay, what's realistic for me? And let's build it small and grow. Because the other thing you're doing the first part is you're establishing routines. So if you get those routines in place early and ready to go, then it makes your life a whole lot easier later um, when you 
when you when you get moving so absolutely do that and of course scaffold independence it's not going to start perfectly don't don't get yourself frustrated because that happens a lot teachers go oh day one was a fiasco they're hanging off the lights okay what are we going to do differently tomorrow we're going to try it again reset and do it again so all great things to think about when implementing that small group time and again i know i have some experienced teachers out there can some of you give me some ideas too um what do you do how do you make sure it goes well and while you're doing i'm going to read some ideas Deb had a couple more ideas um, have them partner and orally tell a partner what the sentence is they're going to write make lines to indicate the words they're saying then independently write the words in the blanks that's an excellent idea so if I said the boy is here I'm putting blanks now I need to write those words in the blanks excellent idea and in workshops group meeting how does it look how does it sound model these if it gets out of hand bring back to the meeting go over it again how does it look how does it sound discuss that's an excellent idea give yourself that cushion and say listen talk about it practice it this is what it looks like this is what it sounds like especially if you're a primary teacher you've got to show them what everything sounds like don't be afraid to take it away and stop but also you got to come back to it because small group time is critical for success so excellent excellent thoughts excellent ideas there now one of the things we suggest when thinking about workshop time or small group time is we always talked about it in terms of ready set and go and, and when you think about that that kind of gives you phases to go through when implementing something like this so we always used to suggest you know what in the beginning of the year you're in the ready phase this is where you're not even differentiating yet you're not even pulling small you're not pulling one small group in, in the ready phase this ready phase is when you're teaching them how to do it like Deb mentioned you're teaching that when you do something you work quietly you get your job done you keep the whisper if you have questions some people have a rule with the question c3 before me you know or something like that because you if when you're doing small group time you cannot be interrupted every six minutes because if you do you'll get nothing accomplished so establishing those rules are critical um, so ready is when you build that foundation start big or start small independent work you do something independent, I'm just watching you. After a few days of that, then you go to set. When you get to set, that's when you have your students in the small group, and maybe they go to, they do an independent activity, maybe they read or decode a book, and then they go to one workshop area, one set. Easy to do. That's it, just one. And you may pull a group during this time. And you teach them that even though I'm working in my decodable area, I come to Mr. Jeff, I do my work, then I go back to my seat. And then you get them used to that routine. Then when you get to the go phase, that's when you have your small groups in place. You built them up to that point. So now they're able to work in small groups. Now they're able to do these activities in small groups. That's our goal. We want to get them there. But if we don't build the scaffold like we do everything else in our day, if you don't build the right scaffolds, it's not going to work. If you start with go, if your day starts with go, let's just go. Let's do small groups. My te They told me to do small groups. I'm going to do them on the first day of school or the first week of school. And if you did that and you didn't build any foundations or rules, chances are your kids were hanging on the lights. Chances are they were, they, it didn't go well. And I've been that class. I was in that classroom. And I said, I'm never doing this again. And I took a few days off. Then I tried it again. You can't do that. Give yourself calm. Give yourself faith. But build it up and scaffold it in those are some ways to help you implement small group time how do you implement workshop time how do you implement this so our students learn how to be independent so as a teacher I learn how to differentiate things for them and we build this together so they can all be successful because their success is your success so that's something I want you to think about when you're implementing small group time if you haven't done it yet Think about what you can do tomorrow. And if you started it, but you haven't gotten to full small groups, think about how you can scaffold the learning for your students to get them to be independent if they're not there at this moment. Just some things to think about. Now, we've talked about differentiating. We've talked about the activities. We've talked about ideas. I am going to show you, and again, this is something that I want you to see is available. If you don't use Open Court Reading, I'll give you the website. You can go check it out. It's these, these demo, you can check out these resources online. But the idea is, is what is, if you're teaching open court reading 
or if you're teaching Imagine It, here's some things you can do. If you're not teaching Open Court at all, but here's a place you can go to get some of these activities. Very valuable tools. I'm going to show you some resources online that you can use. Um, so, what do we? What are, what's available? If you're teaching Open Court right now, or if you've seen it or used it, there's English Learner. English. <laughs> Approaching level, on level, beyond level. That's a typo. It should be A L. B L and O L. Um, approaching level, on level, beyond level. There's support there. You're going to see intervention lessons I'm going to show you. I'm also going to show you some English learner lessons that we can use, some newcomers' guides, some of that support that can be used. Um, also, some support with practice decodables. My goal is to show you a lot of these resources quickly online, and even the e-games and activities. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go online, but what I want you to do is think about
about, okay, even if I don't use open court, that doesn't matter. Um, I'll show you how to get to this website, but also think about what can you, can you what can you use to digitally help your students? Because if you get them digital, that's one tool you can use to help your students. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go online. And when I go online, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna switch screens here for a moment. And what you see here, I'm gonna log out so you can see this. What you see here is our ConnectEd platform. So I, it's ConnectEd, C-O-N-N-E-C-T-E-D dot McGraw hyphen hill dot com. You go there, you'll get to this page. The username is Open Court Reading. The password is OCR 2016. And I'll make sure we type it in the chat area so you can do that. Kelsey, if you can type that in, I'd appreciate it. But here's a place you can go. If you're, if you're using this program, sometimes the teachers realize that they've been teaching open court, but they didn't realize all this was there. I found that out last week when I was visiting a school in Kansas. So if I click on teacher edition, what you'll see right away when I look in here, if I jump to unit one, lesson two, I'm just picking a random lesson. But what you'll notice here, um, picked the wrong one to go to though. That'd have been a good idea. So what you'll see here right away is as a teacher, one tool I have for differentiation is I can always look here, mouse over all these pieces online. What are some tools right there in the lesson that you can use to help yourself? If you'd use this, pro and some of these tools are awesome. Like here, native speakers of romance, I point out these cognates. Very helpful, quick tips right there. So if you're teaching up a court, don't forget about that. Other resource you're gonna have in your lessons as you're looking at your words and sentences, you will see activities maybe for approaching level, on level, beyond level students. Um, they'll pop up. English. Here's some teacher tips that pop up as well. What you'll also notice is right here, you have your English learner and intervention. If you turn those on, here, here's an English learner guide lesson that popped up that supports this exact lesson. So if your students need help reading the words, this gives you ideas and all these resources are digital that you can use to help your students with this sounds that support this exact lesson. So anytime I see English learner lesson pop up here, like right here's another English learner guide, a great place to go, look, there's my guide, there's my activities. If I don't wanna see it, I turn it off and it disappears. Just as easy. There's my intervention guide right there in front of us. This lesson supports this exact lesson. The difference you'll see is we have let fewer words. Remember I thought about differentiating. Sometimes you might use shorter sentence lines. Here are right pieces right within the core lesson that you can do. Um, other play, and again, this would be all bands. If you go to the red band, you see the same activity, the same tips. Of course, it'd be red band focus. So that would pop up as well. maybe but it's taking a second so we're going to skip it so once again here you'll see differentiation right there there's my English learner tip and as I keep moving down here you'll see more and more strategies supported for teachers so everything is right there for you all the supports there for you for differentiation right there's my differentiation so I mouse over it there's my approaching level support and again notice the sentence stems approaching on and beyond but notice what we have there sentence steps to support our students. So easy tips right within the lessons. Also, if you're using Open Court, over here in the resources section, if I went to resource library, one thing you can grab here right away, these are all PDFs, so it's easy to grab onto. Wow, one thing you have here, this is second grade, so you have challenge novels. So there's challenge novels built in here, and again, you can easily click on this and it gives you an idea. Here's the challenge novel. Um, here's the suggestions for questions you can. So it tells you exactly what to what to do with this challenge novel suggestion. So it's all right there for you. Um, you have that right there. Also, as you're going down here, you'll see English learner photo library cards. If you need photo cards, there are hundred photo cards here you can grab onto. Use those cards. A great tool. Again, you click and download. It's a PDF. Do what you want with it but it's a great tool for you for differentiation, for helping your students, small groups, word sorts, rhyming sorts. Those are all great pieces you can grab onto. Just easy, there's the word on the picture on the front, the word on the back in 10 languages. Also, just wanna talk about quickly, your English learner piece here. There are English learner game boards here because there's, there's actual English learner lessons that you can teach. Um, this one focuses on the newcomer's guide. So I told you about the newcomer's guide 
lessons. There are lessons right there. There's also English Learner Development Game Boards. So all these games, all these activities have games. The games are right here, either color or black and white. The awesome piece here for differentiation, there's a lesson, there's the game board. I just print it and go. Life is easy. So whether you're doing English Learner Support, there's English Learner Teacher Guide. So the English Learner Supports for your newcomers. The English Learner, here's his teacher's guide that go right along with your open court lessons. But these can support any students. I say English Learner, even if your students are native English speakers but language delayed, these activities will help them. And of course, you also have intervention teacher guides. These are all downloadable and printable. You have intervention support here. You have intervention teacher guides right here. So all these pieces are here. You click and download, and the whole lesson is right there for you. So if you teach your pulling small groups, this is an awesome place to go. And the last thing I mentioned, of course, were the digital games. Now, students and teachers can access these games as well. Um, but getting those games, it's really easy to go here to activities. And now I have all these activities, whether it's foundational skills, or whether we're focusing on language arts or whatever, you'll see these games. You click and click, and the game's there ready to go. So it's an awesome independent activity for students to do. Great practice for them. So excellent piece, excellent resources there, right there at point of use, right there to help you out. So um, I know I spent some time over there, but I wanted to show you quickly um, what's going on there and what, what we have what we have what we have in that lesson so you can see see what it looks like see the, the the support in open court but again whatever program you have think about how can I grab those activities how can I use those activities the suggestion I have all the time when I talk to teachers though is when we talk about pulling this all together it's important that we make sure that when we talk about differentiation for our students we make sure that the differentiation first we use the supports within the program and the reason I, or the resource, I want to say program, the resource you use in your classroom. The reason I say that, especially for intervention, one mistake that happens many times is we'll go ahead and Jeff is in op open court or he's in wonders or he's in whatever other program out there. And when I pull him for intervention for tier two support, I give him a different program. And then he gets the teacher, the title one teacher person, he gets a different program. What is Jeff seeing? He's seeing three different ways to do the same thing and he's confused even more. My suggestion, first first line of defense is use what you got. Use what's in the use what's tied into the program. If your sound spelling cards look a certain way in your core program, then make sure when you use that intervention, they use the same sound spelling cards. And you don't just print something off teachers pay teachers because that may not be good for those students. So use the supports in that program first. Um, and it's not just for struggling students. I showed you a lot of activities that would be good for struggling students, but it'd also be good for your advanced students. So please don't just focus on the strugglers. They're important. They're the bubbles. We need to move on. But also, you can't forget about your high flyers because they're they're going to land, and then you're going to have a, you know you're going to have to go catch them. Um, slight modifications make a big difference. Going from five words to four words makes a huge difference. Uh, if you're doing blending, four words line to three words line, that makes a huge difference to your students. But that modification may help them. Giving them the extra support may help them make a huge difference. Um, scaffolding a little more may make that difference that they need. And as soon as that light goes on, all of a sudden they take off. That's what you want. So absolutely. Um, and don't overthink it. You know what's good. You're a teacher. You know what's good. Don't overthink those activities. Some people make things so complicated, and I do too sometimes. Don't make it as complicated. Keep it simple. Keep it focused. And keep your students engaged. And that's really the whole goal of this. So um, I want to make sure I talk about differentiation. I want to make sure I give you some time for questions and answers too. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pass it on over to my friend Kelsey to see what kind of questions are out there. And please feel free to keep chatting, keep talking. Um, tell me what's going on. Tell me what you're thinking. But I, right now I'm going to pass it over to Kelsey. Kelsey? Hi. Great presentation, Jeff. So first uh, we have a question from Ruth. Um, and it says, I have just started putting my at most or my most at risk kids in the middle of the room as i walk around the room i see them from both sides and can help them rather than only as if i was standing in front of the room is this a terrible idea i have a large group that needs help this year so i'm trying to experiment where to put them in the classroom ruth that's i i if you ask me what to do that would be my first suggestion put them there so you can see them. i think that where you put your students makes complete sense to me Put them in a place where you can see them, get to them quickly, and help them out. Um, so 
Short answer, absolutely. Give them that support, give them the scaffolds. Um, sometimes it's good to have a student, like your more, most struggling students with a student that's kind of a middle of the road. Um, that's also a good student to have around, but that's um, definitely a place to go. So, yep, yeah. good, good. Kelsey? Okay, and I did see, uh, Diane, your question in the chat box about middle school ELA. For the site that Jeff was showing you for Open Court Reading, it's a K-3 program. Um, McGraw-Hill does have a middle school ELA program called Study Sync, so I suggest checking that out for um, any resources. Um, so moving on, another question that was asked was when limiting what vocabulary words to focus on during a lesson. Um, how do you choose which words are most important and which ones are important to pre-teach at the beginning of a selection? Jeff? Um, how to decide which words to teach? That's a, that's a really good question because it comes up a lot. And, you know, I tell you, oh, just shorten it out. Um, what I would use is I would first focus on the words that may have the similar path. Like if we're focused on word structure, I would use the words that I know in the selection. I can really focus on that strategy. Um, so if word structure is a strategy, I would do that. Um, if that's not, you know, if, it, if they're all basically the same, we're all doing context clues or something to that nature, then one thing I would do is, um, one e easy thing I would do is look at the words, go, go from five, seven to five, five to three, whatever, cut a couple off. But I would look at the words that you think are like that you, and again, use some teacher judgment, but I would take off the most complex at this point. Like I would take off those words that, like the more the tier three words, and I focus more on the tier two words. Um, that would be, that'd be my first thought. Then the next level of that probably would be to make sure that if I did pull off some of those words, make sure that um, I teach them later, but make sure the words that you think are most necessary to understand the content of the story. Because you know, sometimes when we have stories and we have these um, vocabulary words, some of the words are good words to know, but they may not be, um, as critical as others, so that's I would use those too. Um, our goal is to give our students approximately about 300 words, um, 300 words during the school year. I mean, we need to get, we need to, you know, they need to directly teach them. They need to learn a couple thousand a year, but that's a good start. So I would go with that. Great. Um, okay, so another question is, do you have any tips on quick ways to assess your class to try to inform those small group instructions um, so that you know when they need differentiated instruction and how to group them uh, quickly in the classroom? Jeff? I think I caught that. I think the question is, is looking at your, your groups, how do we know what to use? I would use your, your data to drive your instruction. Um, I wouldn't do the, you know, the, because the lows aren't the holes. Think about the focus. If I'm focused on vocabulary, think about your kids that need the most support vocabulary and pull those at that time. Um, because a lot high flyers and fluency may be a, a struggle in vocabulary. So I would use your data to absolutely drive that instruction. I would make sure you, and, and Jeff may not always be in the struggling group. There's some things that Jeff does well. So he, he needs to be the, in the in the accelerated group in some areas. I would absolutely do that. Um, so it's okay to grab onto him uh, or grab onto them and do that. Keep your groups flexible. Don't keep them static because that's what happens too sometimes is the blues and the reds and the greens and the browns and they all stay the same. We want to keep the groups very flexible. So use that data to drive that instruction. Absolutely. Great. Um, well, those are the questions for this webinar. I don't know, um, Jeff, if you want to give a quick uh, goodbye and thank you, and then we can wrap the session up. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. I'm so glad we have so many people here. I appreciate the, the comments and the feedback. And Diane, thank you so much. Um, absolutely. I also gave my email out there. So if, if you have questions, you can always email us. We're always here to help. Uh, and I, next month, I can't, sorry, I don't remember the next webinar. I think we're doing inquiry next month, if I'm not mistaken. But we do have a webinar next month. So please keep visiting, whether you're a middle school teacher, high school teacher, primary teacher, please join us because there's a lot we can all learn from each other. So thank you so much for um, joining us. I put my web page, my email address up here. It's also in the chat box. But please let us know how we can help you. And we look forward to seeing you next month. So thank you so much.